Welcome back, everybody. It is 1230 and we are ready to get started again. I hope you all had a great lunch and you're ready for our final presentation of the day on the gut microbiome with Martha Carlin. Martha is a citizen scientist, wife and partner of person with Parkinson's, John Carlin, and the founder of the Bio Collective, a microbiome company expanding the reach of science. Since John's diagnosis in 2002, Martha began learning the science of agriculture, nutrition, environment, infectious disease, Parkinson's pathology, and much more. In 2014, when the first research was published showing a connection between the gut bacteria and the two phenotypes of Parkinson's, Martha quit her former career as a business turnaround expert and founded the Bio Collective to accelerate the discovery of the impact of gut health on all human health, including Parkinson's. Martha was a speaker at the White House 2016 Microbiome Initiative launch, challenging the scientific community to think in a broader context. Her systems, her systems thinking background and experience has led to collaboration across the scientific spectrum, from neuroscience to engineering to infectious disease. She is a respected out of the box problem solver in the microbiome field and brings a unique perspective to helping others understand the connections from the soil to the food, to our guts and to our brains. Welcome Martha. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm not used to speaking to an audience that I can't see, so I miss seeing all the smiling faces um, that tell me what I'm saying is getting the point across. So I'll do my best. So this is um, this is my wonderful husband, John, who is really the cause behind, you know, the purpose of everything that I've been doing since 2002 when he was first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, as the introduction said, um, my background was in um, accounting and business systems. I was a systems turnaround expert. And in 2002, when John was first diagnosed at the age of 44, um, I looked at the, the way science and medicine approached Parkinson's and to me, it was clear that it was a systems problem. And so I started to dedicate myself to learning about all the systems and factors that could potentially have led to the disease and lead to new approaches to how to improve the outcome and potentially lead to a cure. And along the way, I learned about the microbiome and in 2014, I'll tell you a bit about Dr. Shepard Hans, but that's really when the microbiome came into awareness for me. I read a book called Missing Microbes uh, by a researcher at, the, uh, at NYU named Martin Blazer. He wrote a book, this book, Missing Microbes, and he was talking about how you know, in the last 50 years, we had grown up in an environment with widespread use of antibiotics and how that had impacted our microbiomes and the rise of what they call non-communicable disease and how antibiotics could be affecting that. And, you know, that kind of sparked an idea in my mind because John had had some history with antibiotics and infections. Um, and then later that year in 2014, the first paper was published connecting Parkinson's and the microbiome. So, you know, for a lot of people, that's a new term. What is the microbiome? Um, well, the microbiome is the trillions of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live in and on our body. And they work to maintain our health. We are actually more microbial than we are human. Um, just the ratio of the number of cells in the body um, there are 1.3 times more microbes than human cells in the body. Um, the number of genes uh, that provide function for us, there are 150 to 1 microbial to human genes in the human body. 
And research has been accelerating since the Human Microbiome Project started in uh, 2012 here in the States. And then there was a European Microbiome Project that started at the same time. And what we've learned from that research is that 90% of disease can be connected in some way to the microbiome. And while each individual has a, a gut microbiome that's as unique as your fingerprint, um, what we've also learned is across these diseases, we can begin to see patterns in the microbiome that can connect uh, to some of those underlying microbial contributors to disease pathology. So, you know, what are some of the, the functions that the gut microbiome performs for us? Well, they produce vitamins. Most people don't really realize that a lot of the vitamins that are important to our health are actually produced by bacteria in our gut. Uh, in particular, the B vitamins and vitamin K. Um, the immune system is developed in the gut. Uh, I think uh, recent research has shown that about 80% of immune system education and information is developed through our gut. Uh, the microbiome is where our food is digested it, and broken down in the stomach and in our mouth as we chew. Uh, these processes all the way through our body break that food down and provide the essential amino acids and nutrients that keep us healthy. They're the building blocks for, for our cells. Um, the microbiome, a healthy microbiome, helps us combat harmful mi microorganisms. It, it makes it supports our intestinal barrier, which is that thin single cell lining that keeps us separated from, you know, what's traveling through the GI tract. And really, the microbiome is the key to proper digestive functioning. And as I said on the earlier slide, they're now showing that 90% of disease can be connected to the gut microbiome. And what's interesting about this, you know, I, I often talk to people with Parkinson's and many of them have, Parkinson's isn't the only chronic disease they have. Um, numerous people I've spoken with have a history of some early thyroid disease before they were diagnosed with Parkinson's. Research is showing that approximately 30% of people who have been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease will go on to develop Parkinson's disease. Comorbidities, or, you know, if you know or don't know that term, that's, you know, when you have more than one disease, it's called a comorbidity. Some of the common comorbidities in people with Parkinson's, as I said, are, are uh, hypothyroid, type 2 diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, such as high cholesterol, um, and depression and anxiety. So maybe it's not so simple as um, just Parkinson's. And what's interesting is, um, as they've started to look at the microbiome in Parkinson's uh, and look at what they call non-motor symptoms, uh, constipation has come up and as they've started to look back historically, um, constipation and chronic constipation can precede a, a Parkinson's diagnosis by as much as 15 years. So you, you begin with a disturbed gut microbiome that slows the motility in the GI tract, and that gradually leads to you know, behavioral changes, depression and anxiety, um, can lead to IBS and ultimately down the road to Parkinson's disease. Uh, back in 2003, um, Dr. Brock proposed a hypothesis for the staging of Parkinson's disease. Brock's hypothesis stated that sporadic Parkinson's, which is the majority of Parkinson's is sporadic rather than um, like family genetics, um, that that was caused by a pathogen that entered the body via the nasal cavity and sub subsequently was swallowed and reached the gut to initiate this Lewy body pathology that's, that's hallmark in Parkinson's disease. 
And over time, as those Lewy bodies are traveling through the, the vagus nerve, the progression in Parkinson's disease. Recent research has actually been showing in animal models, they can infect the gut with certain bacteria and signals and organisms can travel via the vagus nerve, which is goes from the GI tract up to the brain um, to carry these molecules and signals that can be affecting um, the outcome of disease. So if we go back through history, there have been numerous papers, not just in Parkinson's, but also in Alzheimer's and other neurological diseases. Um, there's been a history of research into ver various bacteria, viruses, and fungal infections that may have um, various impacts uh, the neurological system. So this is a, a paper that went through all of the published studies and did what's called a meta-analysis. So they take the data from all these different studies and start to see if they can paint a bigger, broader picture of what these contributors might be. Um, and some of the ones that they looked at were herpes viruses. There's quite a bit of uh, research on that um, in Alzheimer's disease as well. And I do know, um, one of the drugs that is sometimes prescribed in Parkinson's is an antiviral drug. Um, and there are animal models where they can induce Parkinson's-like symptoms with specific viruses. Um, there's research that has shown connections to uh, parasitic infections, such as toxoplasma. Um, there are researchers now looking at the connection between the immune system and uh, mycobacteria. Um, so there are a number of microbial contributors that can present with different pieces of the puzzle of the Parkinson's pathology. And, um, you know, one of the sort of humorous ways my husband likes to talk about Parkinson's is that it's a designer disease because everyone is slightly different. So it's almost designed, you know, person by person. So it could, this could be one of the factors uh, that's contributing to that through your microbiome. So back to my original kind of epiphany. Uh, was this paper by Dr. Philip Shepherhans. He is an MD, PhD in Finland. Um, and he published a paper at the end of de December uh, 2014, where he showed the two primary types of Parkinson's uh, present with tremor dominant or uh, a posture and gait dominant uh, primary symptom profile. And what he showed was that he could through the microbiome sample, and that is analysis of a stool sample, looking at all the genes of the bacteria in the gut, that he could distinguish between those two types of Parkinson's pathology um, by just looking at the gut bacteria. And that was just a huge aha moment for me. And I quit my job. I started funding some research at the University of Chicago doing a time series sampling of my husband John's stool samples and my own to see if we could start to connect the dots in those samples to all of the different things that I had been researching over the years in terms of um, potential contributors, uh, pesticides, herbicides, food quality, infection, antibiotics, all of those things, um, to see if there could, if that might present a map for us. And Dr. Shepherhans has exponentially expanded his own work. We actually became friends through uh, me contacting him after he wrote the paper. I brought him to the United States to the first week-long Gordon Research Conference in Parkinson's. And there he met a number of U.S. researchers that he has gone on to collaborate with. Um, and in that process, we talked a bit about antibiotic exposure, in Finland, um, they have a national health database of all the medical records of uh, the 
the population of Finland, and he was able to go back over a two-year period and assess the risk of Parkinson's associated with various exposures to antibiotic and antifungal drugs and published that research showing some connections to, you know, a, um, various antibiotics 10, you know, five and 10 years before a Parkinson's diagnosis, those antibiotics may have altered the gut microbiome in a way uh, that was part of what led to Parkinson's. He's now, you know, working on inflammation and, you know, this, the prodromal microbiome. So looking at what the microbiome looks like before somebody um, actually gets diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, he's looked at the stability over time and how that can, the changes in the microbiome can impact the course of disease. And so he's really been a global leader in this exciting area of research. Um, and he's brought a lot of people along with him. So, you know, this right here, the, the third line is the, the year um, that Philip published his paper. Um, and you can see the exponential growth in Parkinson's research in the microbiome. In fact, in at the end of 2020, there were over 200 papers published with various research aspects of Parkinson's microbiome. And this is just a few of those key research papers. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of LARC2. Um, LARC2 is one of the most studied um, genes involved with Parkinson's disease. It's, uh, it's an immune system related gene. Um, it's one of the genes that connects inflammatory bowel disease in Parkinson's. Um, it's also a gene that connects um, Parkinson's disease and the negative regulation of mycobacteria tuberculosis. Um, researchers at Johns Hopkins uh, last year were able to show that uh, bacterial amyloid could travel up the vagus nerve in and reach the brain. Um, and then uh, Circus Masmanian from Caltech, who's another one of the real leaders here in the United States, um, he showed that in his animal models, he could actually do a, a fecal transplant. Uh, that's taking a um, stool sample from a human Parkinson's patient and putting uh, the, those species into a mouse he could induce uh, the Parkinson's-like symptoms. And this actually led to the founding of a company called Axial Biotherapeutics that is working on targeted microbiome therapy for Parkinson's disease. So how does all this work if, you know, there's maybe a low-grade chronic infection that the immune system is constantly having to take care of what happens is you get increasingly uh, significant inflammation over time, uh, which leads to oc oxidative stress, and that impacts your immune status. Your, your immune system gets fatigued of, you know, constantly having to do, deal with this inflammation. So uh, there's a, a, a researcher, Malu Tanzi, who was at Emory, who's now moved to the University of Central Florida, which has set up a huge microbiome center. Um, she's an immunologist, and she is um, studying this area in particular, um, the inflammation connection and connections to Parkinson's and IBS. So what happens in oxidative stress? Well, it, it starts this cascade of um, a number of, of kind of pieces of the puzzle that tie into Parkinson's. So you get amyloid fo formation, you get circulating bacterial, they, they call them inflammagens, but it's basically cell, pieces of the cell wall of the bacteria that are irritating. Um, you get biomarkers like iron. There's a long history of um, research in the connection to um, iron metabolism and Parkinson's. And what's interesting is, you know, iron is something that um, pathogenic bacteria 
fight for iron in the human body, and there's sort of this ongoing battle uh, for who gets to use the iron. And as that moves along, you know, this inflammation and immune system overactivation starts to lead to alpha-synuclein aggregation. It affects the mitochondria, the gut-brain axis, and depending on what Parkinson's risk genes you may have and what other environmental factors uh, uh, may be involved, um, you end up with Parkinson's disease. So what are some ways that microbes might impact Parkinson's disease? Well, so when you have slow transit, you know, constipation, you have waste sitting in the GI tract, this leads to toxin buildup, putrefaction, and fermentation. And bacteria produce a number of toxins that have various impacts on cells and the lining of our gut. And as the, the intestinal lining um, gets weakened or these holes get poked in the, in the gut, um, you start to get more toxins circulating in the system. Um, and that enables the release of something called light chain, which is amyloid, and that can block neurotransmitter release. So there's a number of bacterial metabolites too that are also being studied. Short chain fatty acids, um, you know, these are uh, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. Um, and these are, um, so butyrate is very important for the gut, um, but as the microbiome changes, people with Parkinson's are losing bacteria that produce butyrate, and butyrate helps maintain the strength of the gut lining, uh, but they may be producing more propanate, which is a, a short-chain fatty acid that can uh, affect uh, brain inflammation. Um, there's a researcher at, the, at uh, Denver University, um, Dr. Daniel Paredes, that we've done some work with our microbiome bank, and he's identified um, polyamines in the blood of people with Parkinson's. And these polyamines uh, we're looking at now, uh, which ones are being produced by the gut bacteria and how that might be um, impacting Parkinson's pathology. So if you thought Parkinson's was simple, it's not really that simple. <laughs> What was initially thought to be a simple process is, in fact, an incredibly complicated, intricate, and complex system. This is a, my a, attempt at humor, but what I'm trying to do is show you that there are many factors um, and try to kind of take us down a path now to think about um, what that might look like. So I like to use John's health timeline although this doesn't look simple, um, can maybe give you a picture in a real-time human way of some things that were clues to what was going on in John's digestive system as early as when he was a baby. So when he was born for the first four years of his life, he had some pretty significant digestive issues. He had uh, trouble, um, trouble with milk and formula, and for the first four years of his life, they, they even thought about doing a, a surgery for something called pyloric stenosis, which is an early, was an early indicator that the valves in his GI tract might not have been working well. Then he had a surgery when he was just two years old. So that would have been, you know, a, a point in time where he would have been given antibiotics early in life. Um, he had a long history of allergies and took allergy shots. So that's another kind of clue to maybe differences in his immune system compared to other people's. Um, in high school and college, he was a golf caddy. Um, and what, you know, a lot of people don't think about it. I do talk to, you know, people with Parkinson's who are avid golfers. Um, there are a lot of um, herbicides used on golf courses to keep them beautiful. Um, so if you are a golfer, you might want to consider after you've played golf, uh, you know, taking a good shower and, you know, washing off any contact that you would have had with those uh, herbicides. But he had a long history there. He had, um, he worked for a company, I can't remember the name of it right now, but um, 
when he was in college in the summers that used a lot of toxic chemicals and, and uh, mercury in the manufacturing of, of uh, manometers, I think is what they were. So he was coming in contact with those kinds of things. When he graduated from college, he worked um, in the oil and gas industry in Texas. So he would have come in contact with, um, you know, the, the hydrocarbons from oil wells where he was calling as a salesperson out in the field. Um, so there, you know, there's this setup early in life of these environmental factors with what's potentially already a sensitive immune system. Um, later in life, he started his own company, which actually can be quite stressful. Stress is a, a real high contributor to what goes on in the microbiome and can set up these, you know, vicious circles of uh, stress chemicals that are produced that then affect the brain, that then affect the gut, and you start this kind of cycle. Um, you know, foreign travel um, and and getting, um, you know, if you're traveling overseas and you get, or you get food poisoning, these things can impact your gut. Um, in 2002, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I mean, he started to, you know, we started to look at our food. Um, now, alcohol is another thing that can impact your microbiome. While John never was a really big drinker, um, he now doesn't drink any alcohol at all. Now that we've learned the impact that alcohol can have on the, the gut microbiome. Um, and then in 2008, he learned how exercise uh, could really impact mitochondrial health and Parkinson's disease, a researcher from uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Jay Alberts, um, showed that by riding a bicycle for a, uh, at a certain cadence for a certain number of times a week, you could reduce your Parkinson's symptoms by about 35%. And John has really been a leader in the Denver community in setting up pedaling for Parkinson's classes um, and uh, working to you know support other people with Parkinson's. Um, we actually took a trip to Australia, and John. Uh, got a virus. They didn't know what it was at first. And so for about four months, we were going through some pretty intense um, evaluation of what was going on there. And they eventually treated him with a very powerful um, antibiotic. Uh, so he was on six weeks of Leviquin. And that also, you know, impacts your microbiome quite significantly. And then over, then in 2016, uh, that data collection that I had started at the University of Chicago, we started to really look at all of that data and start to see the picture of what could be going on in, in John's uh, gut and how we might be able to fix that. And I went to the um, World Parkinson's Congress in Portland, Oregon with John, and there was a, a research group um, from... Israel called Clinic Crowd that was presenting some research from a scientist there who showed that the sugar alcohol mannitol could reverse the aggregation of the proteins in an animal model and pull them out of the brain. This group has gone on to do a, a pretty significant citizen science project, and you can find research on that on their website, uh, Clinic Crowd. Um, but at that time, because I had started a microbiome company, I actually formulated a probiotic specifically for John, and he started to take that while we were measuring his results, and we could see what was going on on there. So John started to take a really active role in cutting sugar out of his diet, eliminating alcohol, really focusing on healthy food, and, you know, if you're familiar with the UPDR score, John's, uh, the higher the score, the more advanced your disease. And John's score, uh, his high score was in 2018, and that was a 35. And um, at our most recent appointment, um, John's score was a 20, and it's been fairly stable in the range of 19 to 20 for um, really since late 2018. So, um, you know, I think with some focus on your microbiome, you can impact the course of your disease and help to make yourself healthier. 
Um, I, you know, I don't think it's as simple as, um, you know, that's going to uh, fix a complex, complex system. But the microbiome is really key to your overall health. And so the more you can focus on that, um, the more impact you're going to have on your, on your health. So I like to use John's chart as an example for people so that they can see um, really what's, what's going on in a real human system. Can you please stop that? So this is how I took, um, you know, kind of what was going on with John, and I have tons of notebooks where I write information and try to connect the dots, and this is just an example of one of my notebooks and all these different factors, genetic susceptibility, environmental trigger, triggers, viruses, uh, fungus, bacteria, um, and, you know, other clues that I've seen over time. Um, so what does impact the microbiome? Well, of course, you know, what's traveling through our GI tract is the biggest contributor, but everything really impacts your microbiome. You know, the quality of air you breathe, where you live, um, so many factors, but but the, the things that you can have, you know, some of the, some impact on yourself personally are by understanding how food and water quality can uh, really contribute to a healthy or an unhealthy microbiome. Sugar and processed foods, there's lots of research going on today connecting these to an unhealthy microbiome. Excessive protein consumption, um, antibiotics that I've already addressed, pesticides, um, there's a uh, been quite a bit of research in the last few years on proton pump inhibitors and how those can impact um, the gut microbiome. And things that can improve your microbiome is really a high fiber diet. Um, they've shown that um, by increasing your fiber intake uh, in just 30 days, you can have a significant impact on your microbiome. Um, the variety of plants that you eat has a significant impact on your microbiome. The healthiest people in the um, American Gut Study were the people who ate the largest variety of plants. Um, so, you know, focusing more on healthy plants, um, organic, because, you know, so much of our food supply does have pesticide and herbicide residue. So, you know, if you can't buy organic all the time, then you want to look at something called the Dirty Dozen, um, which is those foods, uh, they put out a list every year of those foods that have the highest pesticide residues. Uh, fermented foods, which, you know, uh, history, you know, down through the ages, uh, people fermented foods and, and you know, those are health producing, we know, y yogurts and probiotics. People are really trying to look now at probiotics that are specifically designed to, to try to address lost function or um, lost microbes. Um, the University College Cork in Ireland um, is really a pioneer. Uh, they, the very first slide I showed um, with the statistics about the microbiome, that was actually done by University College Cork. They have a lot of wonderful research, uh, resources on their APC website, and um, they work a lot with the food industry on how to improve um, food quality and to uh, do research in probiotics. And they were pioneers in looking at probiotics and depression as opposed to replacing antidepressants with probiotics. Um, John Cryan and Ted, Ted Dinan have a book called The Psychobiotic Revolution, where they talk about their research and all that they have found and kind of explain the microbiome um, in a really accessible way for, for um, the non-scientists to understand. So what now? How can you, you know, how... You ask, how, like, how can I improve my microbiome and gut health? Um, because you really can have an impact. So one of the things I talk about a lot is um, staying hydrated. So healthy cells are more than 40% water inside the cell. 
Um, it's important to stay properly hydrated and in Colorado where it's very dry, um, that can sometimes be difficult. Um, and water quality is important. What a lot of people don't realize, we treat our water with chlorine in order to kill the pathogens in the water, but you'll have these the chlorine residue in the public water system, and then chlorine will impact your microbiome. There are also numerous pharmaceuticals in the public water supply, and there's no regulation around um, the pharmaceutical residues in public water. So it's important if you can to filter your water. If you have a well, it's also very important to test for heavy metals and other harmful substances uh, that can seep down into, um, into the wells, particularly if you live in agricultural areas. Um, food, so it's, it's not just what you eat, but it's the quality of what you eat. So I see so many dietary fads out there, um, but what they don't often talk about is the importance of the quality of the food. Where did the food come from? How was the food grown? Um, so it's important to educate yourself on food quality. Um, I mentioned organic um, diet as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a doctor, uh, Lori Mishley, I think uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, interviews her periodically, and she has a number of videos. Um, she has some long-term research that she's been publishing showing um, the people who do better in their Parkinson's outcome eat less meat and more vegetables um, and avoid processed foods. Um, the other thing you can look at really is the nutrient quality of the food, ensuring that you're getting nutrient dense foods. Uh, there's another uh, physician, uh, Dr. Terry Walls, who has MS herself, um, and she's written a number of books. She has something called the Walls Protocol, um, and it really is focused on nutrient dense foods and ensuring that your body has the raw materials for healthy cells. Um, Avoiding sugar, I've talked about that. Eating more fiber, um, I know everybody loves bran muffins. Um, and something, something as simple as chewing your food. Um, I think we're in such a hurried society today, you know, we don't slow down. Um, digestion actually begins in the mouth and so many of the enzymes that start that process are in your mouth. So if you don't chew your food well, you're not getting enough of those digestive enzymes to really kickstart the, pro the process. Resting your digestion is also important. That can help revitalize your digestive fire. So, you know, there, there's been a lot of uh, research coming out on intermittent fasting, which just means um, you're, you're um, narrowing your window of eating during the day uh, so that you're, GI tract has enough time to digest what's in there and rest. Um, and th there's, um, you know, various uh, books and research articles about that. Um, some people take digestive enzymes if they're really unable to, to digest their foods. Fermented foods will have digestive enzymes in them, and probiotics will help you make uh, digestive enzymes. Um, and then, of course, I have to uh, focus again back on exercise. Um, I've been really fortunate over the years with John working with the pedaling for Parkinson's in the biking community um, in meeting so many people in the Denver area who bike in the programs that he helps run and box. Um, I've really missed the group of people that I uh, boxed with over the last year um, because I I hear about their history while we're working out together. You can walk, you can swim. Tai Chi and Qigong are wonderful. Um, reducing your stress, take up meditation, uh, try to remove the stressors. I'll, I'll say one point on that. Um, along this way, maybe you can tell I'm a type A person. And um, I actually started to think about how my type A personality was affecting John, and I started to change my own behavior so that I could uh, stop being one of those low-grade chronic stressors that was impacting his health. 
And I think he would tell you today, I, most of the time I do a pretty good job. Um, it's important to stay connected. Uh, Lori Mishley has also shown in her research that loneliness can be a predictor of poor outcome in Parkinson's. And of course, that's a big challenge this last year. So we need to stay connected with each other and um, keep moving and have hope. You can own this part of your health. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Martha. Uh, I always love how informative you are, but you also give great tips that people can take away and use immediately, which I think is so helpful. Um, we do have a question. So we do have time for question and answer. So if you do have questions, remember you can type it into the chat box or the Q&A that's on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, the first question we have is from Bob. Your opinion, please, on the use of sugar alternatives and their impact on the gut. Are some better than others? So there actually is quite a bit of research um, on various sugar alternatives. I think a good resource to look for those, um, there is a web, I think they have a website, it's called Gut Microbiota for Health. It's actually a group of, uh, I think, GI doctors in Europe who started this, and they publish a lot of the research around that. Um, I do know that they have shown different sugars uh, have an impact on your microbiome, and I can tell you from our work with my chief scientific officer, who's a world-renowned microbiologist, you know, when we want to grow different bacteria, we select different media, and those media are sugars quite often. So um, those will have an impact, and what I would say is, is um, a lot of the synthetic sugar alternatives, I, I would be careful um, using synthetic sugar alternatives. Okay, thank you. Um, right now, that was our only question. I think you did such a good job of laying everything out that we don't have a lot of follow-up. Um, here we got another one. So does the type or brand of probiotic matter or does the amount count? So this is actually an area that the International Probiotics Association is doing a lot of work because historically the way it's been presented is, you know, the what's called the CFU count, that's colony forming units, um, you know, more is better. That's not necessarily the case. Um, the other thing I would tell you uh, is that the vast majority of probiotics on the shelf um, are all supplied from just three global suppliers. Um, so most of the strains of bacteria that are going to be in those probiotics are um, all the same. So there's a lot of focus and effort now on bringing diversity um, to what's in probiotics and making probiotics that are really focused on specific functions or solving specific problems. And, you know, that's, you know, when I talk about the probiotic I made for John, I actually made a, a, with my chief scientific officer in a, a program, a software program that we built where we predict how a, a community of probiotic bacteria interact together. I made that formula so that it would convert the glucose and fructose in his gut into mannitol. Um, so there's a lot of uh, research ongoing, um, and I would just say, you know, do your research and, uh, you know, make sure you're trying, you're getting some variety and some specificity. If you have constipation, that it is a it is a probiotic that um, helps with constipation, or if you, you know, have some other issue that you're looking for something that's more targeted. Okay, terrific. Um, let's see, continuing on, um, from Kirk, what about fecal transplants? Yes, so, um, so a fecal transplant for people who may or may not know, um, first started being used in, uh, in medicine in the United States, um, for the treatment of a C. difficile infection. And uh, um, that's actually can be quite fatal um, in people who get C. diff. Um, 
and they were trying to treat it with antibiotics with very poor success rates and sort of went back into some of the really old literature and found that um, in China, they actually uh, used something called yellow soup that was uh, fecal transplants from uh, babies uh, to help people with GI issues. And so this, this uh, idea of using a fecal transplant from a healthy person to restore the gut microbiome has become quite popular in C. diff. Um, there's a company called Rebiotics who's actually bringing that product to market um, as a prescription treatment. Um, and there are researchers who are doing research in Parkinson's disease um, using fecal transplants. So they would work on trying to wipe out the microbiome that's there as much as they can and then restore it with a fecal transplant. I think the last time I looked, there were four or five ongoing clinical trials at um, clinicaltrials.gov um, that uh, are doing that. And I think it's an interesting area of you know, potential future treatment. It does sound very interesting. Um, let's see, from Chris, what about PS128? Are you familiar PS with that? I'm not. Yes, 128. Yes, 128. Is that a probiotic? I'm not sure. Chris, if you want to give us a little more context around that, we'll move on to the next question and we can come back. Um, from Jackie, is there research on the effect of mer mercury um, used in dental fillings and Parkinson's disease? I haven't seen specific research on mercury fillings in Parkinson's disease. But there is a long history of um, research with, you know, showing the connection between heavy metals and uh, neurotoxicity. And mercury is one of those metals. Uh, and that actually was something we tested John for early on, and he would had a very high level of mercury. He grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and you know, you're during the 60s and 70s, you know, there there was a lot of mercury and, and then he worked at that company with mercury. But in the filling area, I haven't seen uh, specific papers about that, but I have to admit, I haven't looked for specific papers about that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then there was a follow up to the fecal question. If, um, if it was something that they wanted to to do or, or be part of a study, is it readily available in the U.S., and how would one go about getting that procedure? So there, I do know there is a, there's a doctor in California who is part of a trial system uh, that is doing them, and I can't remember her, Dr. Hazan, but I, I can't, if you want to email me at the address on this, uh, on this slide, um, I can get her name and, and let you know that. And I can also look up on clinicaltrials.gov and send you the information on that. Great, okay. Um, from John, how do you recommend, or do you recommend laxatives or Miralax? So there's actually been research that Miralax changes the microbiome if you use it long-term. Uh, so, I think um, if you want to email me, I could um, send you some research on that. Um, of course, chronic constipation, I don't think people really understand, um, you know, if somebody who d doesn't have the kind of constipation that some people in Parkinson's have, uh, they don't really understand the magnitude or the impact on somebody's um, daily living. Uh, that this can have. And I, by that, I mean, you know, some people might only go to the bathroom once a week, and I don't know if that's this person's problem. So, you know, it's important to get relief, um, but it's also important to try to figure out how to get um, working, because if you use laxatives all the time, then, you know, you end up in a situation where um, you can't go without the laxative. Um, so there are some other things like, you know, the water intake, the 
fiber, uh, fibers and things that can help. Um, and, um, you know, I'd be happy to send you some more information on that. Okay, all right. Um, from Barbara, what are the best resources for staying abreast of the latest research on PD and the microbiome? So, well, I actually do, I have a, a, a website that I just started in December to try to kind of pull all this information together uh, that I've learned over the years uh, of you know, being John's partner. Um, and that's Martha's Quest. And I actually do a quarterly um, summary of some of the key papers and then provide a link to the PubMed search if you wanna look at all the papers. I provide you a link so you can look at all of those papers. And so if you go to Martha's Quest, um, you can find that on the website. Okay, great. Um, and then Chris did give us a little more information on that. So he says, yes, by Solace, I'm gonna butcher this, but it's lactobacil plantaris with high dopamine output. Okay, so it's a, so it's a lactobacillus plantarum. Okay. <laughs> um, Lactobacillus plantarum is a is a really wonderful probiotic organism. I'm not familiar with that particular one, um, but um, I am familiar with a number of uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, and you know we have one ourselves that we actually I isolated from uh, fruit we collected and fermented from Longmont, Colorado. So. Um, Lactobacillus plantarum is a is a wonderful probiotic organism, and um, I'd love it if you would email me the name of that one because I'd I'd just love to look at the research behind it. Terrific. Okay, and um, that is it for the questions. But I did want to read as I say thank you to to you because I do think this is so true, um, Jonathan made a comment that said uh, perhaps one of the most down to earth informative talks I have ever encountered. Um, and I, I think you are so good at boiling this down and making it understandable and putting it in layman's terms. And we really do appreciate your taking time with us here today to do this presentation. Thank you so much for having me. And I miss all my Parkinson's people. I hope to see you soon in real life. Terrific. Thanks so much, Martha. And I do want to remind people that if you haven't already visited the Bio Collective booth and website um, to learn more, please feel free to do that. You saw the um, website posted up there on Martha's presentation. And with that, we are going to move on. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you so much. All right. So believe it or not, we are done for the day. And I just really want to thank our audience for joining us today and to all of our speakers who provided this amazing information. I also want to thank our sponsors, Supernus, Health One Swedish Medical Center, and Clara Health for supporting today's conference and for all of our clinical researchers for being here today and for working hard to find new and innovative ways to help people with Parkinson's live their best lives. There is going to be a survey sent out to all the attendees after the conference, and please take a couple of minutes to fill this out. Not only do we value your input, but we use, we use this information to plan future educational events. So your input is really important to us. And then also a reminder on the leaderboard that it will close at three o'clock. So if you haven't been out to visit some of the um, exhibitor booths and some of the research clinic booths. Um, please take the time to do that. We will close it at three o'clock and announce the winners. And then I briefly want to mention um, a project called Give a Dime About Parkinson's. It's a campaign that started on March 16th by a team of international Parkinson's experts, uh, Dr. Michael Open, Dr. Boss Blome, Dr. Ray Dorsey, and Dr. Todd Shearer. And it's inspired by the March of Dimes to End Polio campaign. So this red letter campaign aims to stop the use of chemicals linked to Parkinson's, increase Medicare telemedicine coverage, and increase NIH research funding to help end Parkinson's. So to learn more about the campaign or to order your letters, you can visit the link in the chat or you can call the Parkinson Association at 303-830-1839 and we can give you more information about that. Also, a very quick mention about our upcoming events this year. 
We have quite a few things planned. We are really hoping to get back in person. And our first in-person event will be the Vitality Walk that's going to be held on June 6th. It's in four different locations. Um, so please jump on our website and see which one is closest to you. On September 18th, we will have our E3 conference. And on November 20th, we will have our third annual Care Partner Summit. If you're interested in learning more about any of these events, please visit our website at www.parkinsonrockies.org or feel free to give us a call. We are all back in the office at 303-830-1839. And I am so thrilled that we were able to do this conference today and share with this amazing community. I really appreciate all of you taking some time out of your Saturday and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.